Good afternoon. I'm Charlie Trouble, and I'm the treasurer of Scripps Fine Arts Foundation. I joined the Fine Arts Foundation last year when Scripps spun off the FAF to be independent. I also serve as an advisory director to the Museum of Neon Art, or MONA as we call it. I provide financial advice to MONA when asked. I would like to introduce today's speaker, Corey Siegel. Corey is the executive director of MONA. And now the next part is kind of my perspective, but it's really important. <laughs> Corey became the MONA's director just before the COVID cut shutdowns in 2020. While the museum was closed to the public, she skill skillfully navigated MONA through the difficult times. To address the challenges, Corey sought grants and loans, cut costs, and partnered with local government. Additionally, she introduced a walking tour event to LA communities to, in order to combine, <laughs> comply with pandemic rules. All in all, she's been a, a, a driving force in saving Mona. Corey has had a prolific career in the Los Angeles art world for over 20 years. She's not only an artist, but she's a museum and gallery professional. She is particularly interested in engaging her community with art. So if you would, please join me in welcoming Corey to the Fine Arts Foundation today. She will tell us about the Museum of Art. Thank you so much for that, Charlie. Um, I don't know, I'm sure you all know, after being in Charlie's presence, what a superpower he is. He is the wind beneath Mona's wings. I don't think we would be where we are today without his steadfast guidance. I just cannot begin to thank you more. It's been um, a real honor working with you. Thank you all for having me here. Um, I'm really excited to talk to you. We have a lot of different directions we could go in, so I kind of wanted to pull you, see what you were most interested in talking about. I have a bunch of slides of fine art made with neon. Um, I also have a lot of historic material. I could do kind of the greatest hits and just click through a lot of different slides. Are there any preferences? Slides. Slides? Greatest hits. To greatest hits? Okay. So you're gonna get a rapid fire of a lot of different things that we do at Mona and a lot of different artworks and vernacular um, signage. So this is a view of our gallery. Can you all hear me too? Yes. Okay, yes. perfect. Um, so in our gallery, which is located in Glendale, California, we have a range of um, contemporary and uh, artwork from the 1920s. Uh, most of that artwork is in the form of signage. And I'm going to show you this little video and talk over it. So you can kind of see the way that the gas is pulsing through that sign. What you're seeing there is plasma. It's a mix of high pressure gas. And every single sign is bent by hand. Uh, glass bent over flame. You can do a lot of really amazing things with plasma. We are conductive, so a neon sign or a neon artwork will respond to the human body because we're all electric beings. And we showcase a range of cutting edge contemporary artwork and also teach classes. So this is our bombarder. This is how we fill up our neon signs with gas. And sometimes we do death defying stunts to fix signs. Um, some of you might have recognized David Svensson, who is uh, definitely a Claremont guy and incredible artist. You'll see some of his work later. He regrets that he couldn't join us today. He's installing our next exhibition, which opens April 16th. It's free. I hope you'll join us. And um, this is our warehouse, which is pretty close. It's um, in Pomona. We will be opening it soon. So if you're interested in visiting the museum but don't really want to drive out to Los Angeles, um, you can see our collection when we open it on our warehouse days. And it's actually soon to become, we're, we're partnering with a brewery. So this is an animator. This is how our signs click on and off. And you can see this is the way we clean our signs. We're getting ready to take down the House of Spirits here. That's part of the, this is the biggest sign collection to enter our museum. 
It was the second sign I got on my tenure. So it was, uh, it's very stressful, <laughs> but really cool. And another video of our galleries. So things are constantly changing and we have constantly had artist leadership. So that um, piece where you saw the eyeballs were tongues, that's by Michael Fleckner, who's now the vice president of our board. We also have walking tours, which Charlie mentioned earlier. And these were just created during the pandemic when you could only have gatherings of like 12 to 15 people, depending on when uh, that happened. This is Michael Fleckner, the artist I mentioned earlier. He's using the crossfire. And um, one of our openings before we went into the pandemic. So neon. Neon is pretty mysterious in a lot of ways. It's one of these things that we all know and recognize, but many people don't know it's bent by hand and they don't know why it's called neon. So most signs don't even contain neon gas. Um, I've brought my handy dandy neon salesman suitcase so you can see the gases being electrified. Um, the right hand side of that salesman suitcase is neon gas and the left is argon mercury. So I like to kind of joke when people come to visit Mona that we should actually be called the Museum of Argon Mercury Art because that's the majority of our pieces, but that just doesn't have the same ring to it. Um, neon was the first gas to become successfully electrified. So it's kind of like if I were you know, to say, hey, can I have a Kleenex? And you're like, I only have Scott's tissues, you're out of luck. You know what I'm talking about. So neon is this bright red orange gas. It's it coursing through the fingers of the skeletal hand. And this is a piece that is um, single electrode, which I'll talk a little bit more about, um, which is a way that artists make work with plasma. Um, so plasma, it's the same material as our sun, our stars, it's lightning in a bottle, and that's what a neon sign is. So every gas, when it's electrified, uh, lets off a different wavelength. It's sort of like if you have short legs, you're going to walk at a different pace that someone has longer legs. Um, so helium, when it's electrified, it lets off this peachy white orange. Neon is this bright red orange, argon is a lavender, krypton is kind of bluish white, and xenon is also bluish white. And they're much dimmer than the rest of the gases. So this is Michael Fleckner working in our fires, and he's using a tool called the ribbon burner. Michael's known for making three-dimensional work, and he's working on a um, pattern. So most neon artists will start first from a pattern and they bend the glass in really exact ways to fit to that pattern. Um, you might have noticed he has three marks and that's indicating to him where he needs to heat up the glass in order to accurately bend it. So every um, neon artist starts with a tube of glass that's about this long and straight and then they bend it expertly. And you can take a class at Mona and learn how to bend glass yourself. And then you see how impressive this is because it's, um, you know, when you're bending glass, it's, it's really crazy. It's kind of like alchemy where you're transforming matter. So all of a sudden you're holding your glass over the fire and you feel this invisible hand of gravity tugging down at the glass and you realize that your hands are no longer kind of working together. So you have to really practice for many years. So he has a blow hose and that blow hose he's using to measure the shapes here so he can heat up the right amount of glass. That blow hose he also uses, um, he connects it to the glass itself. One side has a cork, the other side has the blow hose and he sucks and blows to maintain the circumference of the tube. So it's a really specialized form of glass blowing. Very complicated. Um, and people say it takes a long time to become a bad bender. Um, but Michael, he's kind of a special character. When you go into our gallery, there's this shuttle that he created in the 1980s. It was the first artwork he made when he was learning to bend neon glass. 
and it's impeccable. It's insane. I don't know how he did it. Um, but he's one of those people who doesn't, you know, when he wants to do something, he goes all the way. So you can see he has the tube connected to the glass and then also connected to his mouth. Circles are the hardest shape to bend when you're making neon. You can't just bend it straight away. When you're working with a pattern, you have to be really strategic. So he's bent each side of the circle and now he's using the ribbon burner to sh um, soften the center and he's gonna burn that into a complete circle. The circle, um, human eyes can really detect deviations in a circle. So to make something that looks like a perfect circle is really challenging. Um, but yet again, he's showing, he's showing off for us. He's a very skilled bender and also just kind of the funniest, sweetest guy. One of the things that I love the most about working at Mona is what a unique institution it is. It's one of the longest running artist run museums in the world. We were established in 1981 and we continue to be operated by artists, both our board, um, myself as executive director, and most of our staff are artists. So here he's using um, some blocks to arrange his artwork um, and do his very kind of characteristic 3D bending technique. So he's propping up the glass and he's using a hand torch here. You can see how he's sucking and blowing. Do you see how that's inflating? Um, and you have a little give so you can stretch it out a bit. Um, but then you, you can see where the blow hose <coughs> is attached and how he's heating both sides of the glass to soften it and fuse it together. This is a pretty hard move in neon. Then we use a file to cut the glass. Glass is actually stronger than steel. Um, it's very fragile, but it takes a lot to cut it. So you need like um, a very sharp file. And then he attaches electrodes. So that little um, kind of looks like an insect, metal insect, that's an electrode. And that's what's gonna power the sign. Now he's putting mica between the places that the glass is really close together. Mica is an insulator, so it's, the energy isn't going to arc from glass to glass. This is a diffusion pump. This is what is going to suck out all the impurities of the sign. And Michael is getting ready for the bombarding process where we enter the gases. So this is neon argon krypton gas, and he has a gauge as um, he puts in gas the level of that red liquid is going to be um, displaced. So you can see how much gas he puts in. This is zapping it with super high voltage electricity to remove all the impurities of the sign. And then this is after he's added neon gas. So that's what the final product look, look, looks like. So if you're curious about um, how neon is made, um, Linda Sue Price, who's an artist, who's the treasurer of our board, so she and Charlie talk a good deal. Um, she's a very talented artist, and she took a neon bending class when she was 50 and sold her work right at the kind of reception for the class. And then she was like, ooh, I guess I get to like make another neon for to keep for myself. And then she sold that, and then she sold the next one, and the next one. So she became an instant neon artist. And um, she created a, or recorded her um, feelings and relationship with the glass over several years to um, kind of explain what it feels like to start to learn how to bend neon. So that's on our blog. I'd highly recommend that. And this is her work that was recently on view in our exhibition, 40 Years of Light. Um, I was just talking about how neon benders often work from patterns, but Linda is unique in that she makes 3D um, sculptures and she bends, I would say, kind of as an air bender. So she doesn't bend flat to a pattern. She kind of just follows intuitively what the glass wants to do. And she does lots of loops and swirls. And this piece is called Plan B. And the concept of this is it's a bunch of tubes that she bent for other artworks that didn't kind of pan out. So then she reassembled and collaged them into these um, new artworks. This is a piece by Craig Craft. This is a cast of a 
uh, body, Bonnie Bernau, who is an artist that he, co he collaborated with. And in the 80s, Bonnie was diagnosed with breast cancer. And this was her way of kind of um, dealing with that diagnosis. So they collaborated on this full life-size cast. I've posed for a face cast before, and it is a very, um, you, you have to have a lot of patience. I can't imagine going like this for an hour or so It's um, and being totally encased. So this is kind of a courageous act in and of itself. But Craig Craft and her came up with this pose and the piece is called Bound Diver. So you can see how she's kind of like bravely diving off into the unknown, but her feet are also bound. And the neon is actually embedded into the plaster. So it gives this eerie three-dimensional feeling um, and gradations of color. And then it's also backlit. Um, Bonnie is doing well. She's living her best life in Hawaii. So um, that's a very happy ending to the story. This is a piece by Candace Gone. Um, this is just a detail. Um, those are her hands. And then um, it's a chair that has a glowing seat. This is a wand by Candace Gone. So she makes these really cool wands that react to tessel coils in her plasma vault. So you can do a lot of things with neon. It's not just for you know, signs for um, fast food. It's a fine art medium. This piece is by Brian Coleman. And he experiments with lots of different glasses and shapes and expanses. This work is by Larry Albright. Does anyone recognize the cartoon character? Ready yeah. yeah. So Ready Kilowatt is actually serving as an electrode in this work of art. So he um, is what is putting the electricity into this globe. And um, it's pretty spectacular in person because he's just emanating um, lightning, basically. It's so funny that um, energy companies invented this character in the 1920s to make uh, rural communities not scared of electricity because it, it's kind of a horrifying yeah. image, but it was very successful, so it just goes to show. It's about this size. Mm -hmm. This is a work by David Otis Johnson. He teaches our Intro to Neon art class. So if you're scared of fire, but you still want to make a neon sign, you can learn design and work with um, skilled artists to make your artwork come to life. This is a work by Ray Howlett. It's spectacular in person. Ray um, started off his life as an engineer. He uses a lot of math, so him and Charlie would get along probably. Um, but he's always calculating geometry and he uses um, dichroic glass, which was part of the aerospace industry. And it shifts, um, so it creates this prismatic effect that shifts in color. It's like looking into this infinity room of rainbows. Another piece by Brian Coleman. <coughs> this is by Shen Lo Huang, and it's a dragon. Some people see it and some people don't. Uh, this is by Bill Concanon. He's just such a dear, dear person and an incredible artist and mentor to a lot of young people in the neon field today. And this is a piece by Roxy Rose. It's uh, an animated piece, so love turns round and round is what it's called. Um, it also has the colors of the transgender flag. Roxy um, is a fourth generation neon vendor. Charlie bent with her. Did you bend with her? No. Um, so she, she comes in and she volunteers at um, our museum, but when um, she grew up in a Jehovah's Witness family, very tight knit um, bending family that's kind of like almost like bending royalty, I guess you could say. But um, in her 40s, she was outed um, for being transgender and kind of kicked out of her family for a while. Um, but then she had this second career where she started making art about that experience, about inclusion, about how to treat everyone with respect and all the lessons she learned from being excluded in that way. She's a really inspiring figure and she'll often just drop by Mona and teach people how to bend um, for free. So if you follow us on social media, we often will um, 
kind of alert people that she's coming. And she's become this kind of internet celebrity because, I don't know, for some reason, Mona has a TikTok now and it's become very popular. And um, she's just become such a mentor to people that just are trying to, you know, be there, be there themselves. And um, she's just super funny. So I, I would highly recommend you follow her if you're on her Facebook. Her Roxy Rose, R O X Y R O S E. Um, this is a piece by Stephen Antonakis. He's one of the famous kind of contemporary artists who brought Neon from this kind of perception of, you know, being uh, advertisement to being fine art. So he's a really influential figure. But then advertisement is a form of art. And not only is it a form of art, but it's a, it's a article of memory. It's something um, I think Beth uh, was talking earlier about how, um, what was it, your brother? My dad. Your dad, how he learned, or he learned how to read through reading the neon sign eats. On a trip from Chicago to California in the early 30s, his parents were driving and he saw the neon eats and he learned how to read eats. Oh, love that story. <laughs> so I think each of us probably have a story around a sign. I have a bunch and trust me, I'm at one point in time, I was not so obsessed with neon, but I still had a few sign, uh, sign memories. This is Parisian florist. This um, is still a legacy business located in Los Angeles. It is kind of famous because of a story about Joe DiMaggio. Um, after Marilyn Monroe died, he bought her some uh, like weekly flowers from Parisian florist for like, 20 years or something like that? Am I going over time? Until he died. No. Okay. <laughs> Until he died. So it's a really touching story, but it's also a story about a business that continues to operate today. They had to move from their location, so we rescued the sign. We also have the Chinese theater sign from the Groman's Dragon. Um, this was given to us in a state of disrepair. So we had to completely strip the sign of all the paint, repattern it, bend all the neon. It took a community to restore this, but it's something that speaks to so many people's memories, not only the history of Hollywood, but also just, you know, every, you know, a lot of people who grew up in LA ended up going to a movie here or something like that. This is a pretty simple sign, but it tells an incredible story. This is from, Pasadena Rug Mart. It was established by um, Armenian refugees from the Armenian Genocide in the early 1900s. And then after the family ran that um, store for a while, they handed it over to Iranian refugees. So it tells a story about this kind of intergenerational um, dialogue that happened between these two families. And this is Mar Mariam who helped to donate the sign. This is Matsu no Sushi. It's the first sushi restaurant in the United States. It was located in Little Tokyo. We also have the um, beauty store sign that's also um, shown in this picture as well. We have a really strong um, collection of signs from Little Tokyo. And this sign survived internment. So um, to be able to keep a business running after being incarcerated, being away from your business, like I think a lot of people can identify with the pandemic, um, but it's pretty amazing that this uh, place survived for so long. This is Circus of Books. It was a real meeting point for um, gay Angelinos, and it also um, distributed gay porn throughout um, the United States, which, you know, maybe it seems a little sleazy in some ways, but it was also at a time during the AIDS crisis and during a lot of homophobia that it was one of the few places that gay men could feel comfortable in being themselves. So the story of Neon is kind of, I'm, I'm hoping that I'm illustrating that it's kind of everyone's story. Um, over a circus of books that we recently uh, restored is Billy's Deli. Billy's was a really 
famous deli in Glendale, California, which was a sundown town. So if you were a person of color, you could not be there after the sun went down. Um, it was also a stronghold for the KKK and the American Nazi party. So having a Jewish deli in that area seems a little, you know, challenging. And it was, they were targeted, yet it lasted for a very long time. You can now see this sign in the Skirball show, I'll have what she's having, the Jewish deli, and another sign from our collection. The Brown Derby. So a lot of people, I, I love, I love Lucy, and I love the um, episode where she goes to the Brown Derby and tries to see the celebrities. And this is what we, when we got the Brown Derby, what it looked like. So we had to do body work. We had to make a pattern. We had to bend it. We had to wire it up. Um, and when we re rescue signs, it's a whole thing. It's not just like someone's donating a piece of art and I have to go over and pick it up. I have to talk to the building owner, the community stakeholders, because not only are we trying to save the sign, but we're trying to save the stories and the community message that's involved. So always trying to keep the sign in the place that it originally was, because these are storytellers. This is Clayton Plummer's. And when we um, opened up our space in Glendale, we couldn't, this was too big to display. So we made a replica. So this is the process of creating the sign and sanding off the steel so we could paint it. Uh, House of Spirits, I talked a little bit about earlier. This is a three-dimensional cottage from the 1940s. This is what it looked like when it was illuminated. And we're hoping to return it to Echo Park. Um, this is a text one of the community members um, sent to me. Um, I honestly feel like you're the person for the job to get the word out about what the neighborhood really means to some families. Echo Park, um, Charlie and I were talking earlier about how much Echo Park has changed in the last 20 years. Um, and mm -hmm. For many families that have lived here for generations, their, their family history is at stake with the changing face of the neighborhood and also rising rent. Um, so to be able to share all these stories through the signs is really important. Um, and this is the um, market right across the way from the House of Spirits. Another thing that a lot of people don't know about neon signs is they were seen in the 1960s through 80s as kind of like morally corrupt. So that's part of the birth of Mona is that when um, there's this explosion of signs post-war, there's a lot of funding through the GI Bill and many people studied um, how to bend neon. And neon became really accessible and energy became more accessible. But with that accessibility, every place had a neon sign. And a lot of places that you might not think are reputable institutions. So there became this moralizing of the landscape and the American Beautification Act, which was authored by Lady Bird Johnson, was uh, a way of removing blight from cities. And this idea of like, once you cleanse that city from the, of the blight, you create like a better area. Um, so one of the places that had sign ordinances is Glendale. So this sign, La Fonda Mexican food, was removed in the 1980s due to a sign ordinance, and we now have it in our collection. And these are two different versions of the restoration. Um, originally, she had blonde hair to be visible from a moving car, but in our gallery, because we don't have moving cars in our galleries unless we have something really <laughs> going wrong. Um, we created this comic book, Blue Hair. We also have free downloadable walking tours um, on our website. So even if you just wanna go on Google and go through Google Maps or just read some nice stories about signs, you can go on our website, but you can also download them on your phone or print them out and go on walks throughout LA County. We also have um, different kind of historic takeovers on our Instagram. So you can get a perspective of the neighborhood through um, a local historian. 
We have um, night walks. So this is what Charlie mentioned, where you get to go into a neighborhood and see things for yourself. This is a picture of a lot of pictures of the night walks. And a lot of online programming. So if you're ever bored, you want to see an artist talk um, or a historic tour, you can just go to our website. We also love to take people into uh, people's studios. Neon is alive and well. Um, it is still listed as an endangered craft on the, um, in, in the UK. And a lot of people you know, are concerned about neon survival, but there are so many young artists that are taking up this medium and really making it their own. And you can see some of their studios on our Instagram. This is Danny Bonet. She did our first takeover. That's her neon mask. But you can use it in performance. You can talk about the technical and scientific aspects. Um, we're also really interested in accessibility. So um, we have visual descriptions on our website if you are blind or have trouble seeing or just want like a relaxing voice visually describing a sign in our collection. And we have family guides with all these activities. So if you have kids in your life and you want to give them some neon coloring pages. We got that on our website for free. This is our Pomona warehouse. We will be opening it um, in the next few months um, for special weekend events. And you can also drink a neon themed beer in the brewery next door. This is how we store our neon. So we have this chicken wire, which doesn't necessarily look safe, but it, it's the easiest way to store neon. Another view of a warehouse. Putting things up. I've definitely gotten a lot of workouts working at Mona because signs are heavy. Um, and we also do a lot of advocacy. So Adore Milk Farms is a 1920 sign that was recently unveiled and we advocated for preservation in place and one of our members actually helped to restore that sign. And we also advocated for keeping the Alhambra neon sign um, in its historic state. We have a soon to be opening sign garden. This is the beginnings of it. It looks much better now. And we got a lot of merch. Um, and this is another view of our warehouse. I thank you so much for your attention and I hope you'll come and visit us. We have this free opening April 16th. It's called The Brain Without Organs. It's a contemporary artist, Warren Nidick, who um, recently showed at the Venice Biennial. And it's all about kind of, um, it's like this giant floating brain and it's uh, very conceptual, but also very immersive and fun and black light paintings and other things like that. So um, I hope you'll, um, be a part of our community and come to visit us. And thanks again for having me. Oh yeah. Any questions? Ooh. It's in our old parking lot. So it's connected to the museum, sort of right behind. In Glendale. What was the date for the opening of the Big Brain? April 16th. Six to nine. What's the address? 216 South Grand Boulevard. It's right across from the Americana. So you can do some shopping <laughs> as well. Yes? It looks like your Holy Grail sign is the one that you really want, or did you already find it and get that one? For me, it's so personal, I think. For me, it was the House of Spirits because growing up, my, you know, my friend's coworker, who I thought was the coolest person in the world, I wanted to be like her, she lived in Echo Park. And whenever we drove to her house over the weekends, I was like, oh, we're almost there. And then when I moved to Echo Park, I would you know, take detours when going to my house just so I could see that sign. So it was one of those special things when I got it. I was so happy. Also, Circus of Books. Um, I cried when we got that sign. Um, I still get emotional thinking about it because um, I think Mona's strategically organized in such a way that um, because 
still a lot of people don't think, people think it's kind of quirky to have a museum dedicated to neon. And the idea of it being historic, I think a lot of people question. But in, in that, it's kind of this quirky, accessible institution that can kind of sneak up on you and talk about these things that we're still facing. Um, we're still, like, uh, gay and transgender folks are still facing enormous obstacles to just living a, you know, livable life. So to have a beacon to a place that was there for them in the 1980s when that was seen as almost dangerous, that, um, that was a really moving thing for me. And um, I think it just speaks to the testament of, you know, Neon, that it's, it's light in the darkness. It's this very active, living thing. When you, um, Casey Lees, who's an artist at Mona that has a residency currently, talks about um, these neon signs like their um, like, uh, messages in a bottle or time capsules. Because when you fill a neon sign, it will work. We don't even know how long the life of the neon sign is. Um, neon came on the scene in the early 1920s in the US, and there's still signs glowing today from the 1920s in Los Angeles that are still just working and working. And I think that's like a really special thing that it's this historic, um, but also kind of object that's hidden in plain sight. And it's something that speaks to everyone. It's part of everyone's legacy. Um, no matter what your political standpoint is or your whatever, we can all unite that it's a pretty light, you know? So I think that's, that's something that's really special that we can have all these different dialogues and we can talk about our own experiences. And it's not about what's right or wrong, but just about like where you're coming from because everyone can, you know, everyone lights up the same under neon lights. What are some of the most more famous signs in Los Angeles that we can see that are working today? Ooh, great question, Charlie. Well, Felix the Cat is unfortunately now LED, but it's still a really cool historic sign for Chef, like Felix Chevrolet. Um, the Bendex building, that's downtown, that was part of the restoration process. One thing that Mona has done in the past is relit historic neon signs. Um, in the 1920s and 30s and 40s, um, because of World War I and World War II, a lot of neon signs were turned off. And even though the tube can last a really long time, once the transformer is off for a while, you usually have to ch change out the transformer. So there was a lot of neon signs that were just like hidden until the 1980s and 90s when the Lumens project came into existence. So that was the, the project that relit a lot of signs in the LA landscape, like the Bendex, the Gaylord, um, the Broadway Hollywood, so those are some some key ones that we were a part of relighting. But you know, yeah, they just now that I know how neon is made, I it's I feel so bad for my boyfriend because whenever we're walking along, I have to stop and look at like you know it might be a, like a, a Burger King sign, but I'm just like, oh, look at that bending, that's so amazing. Um, because now we're all part of this secret fellowship. Most people don't know neon is bent by hand. So next time you walk along, you can realize like, oh, wow, like every, like it's looking at the details, each one of those details is hand bent, hand um, uh, shaped. So I think that that's one of these things where um, you start to have this very human connection to the landscape, which is kind of, it's just so cool. It's like a cipher, or like a decoder ring to understand your place in the world. Are there any other museums of the art? Yes, we were the first. <laughs> but I'm so glad to say there's, um, there's the American Sign Museum in Cincinnati. There's the Neon Museum in Las Vegas. There's the Philadelphia Neon Museum, Ignite Museum in Arizona. There's also a lot of outdoor displays um, of neon. And what is so ironic and interesting is we had this um, episode of 
when neon comes to the United States in the 1920s, it is synonymous with class. Like if you have an old neon, uh, old building or a new building, you have to have a neon sign. So the, it was kind of like these big LED screens on buildings today. It was, you know, you were up to with the times and it was very expensive and rare to have a neon sign. And then um, in the 1940s, in the depression, Franklin Delano Roosevelt paid shops to restore their facades. And part of that was funding neon. So we got a lot of neon from that. Then we have the um, vets that learn neon bending and spread far and wide with little neon shops. And then there's like neon everywhere. And it's, there's nothing special about neon and it's actually seen as like poor class to have a neon sign. And all that neon was removed um, in the 80s. That's when Mona came into existence. It was basically founded by a few dumpster diving artists that saw these pieces of history that no one appreciated at the time being sent to the scrapyard. And now it's really cool that there are museums across the world, Poland, uh, Berlin, that are showcasing this medium and see what value there is here. There's even um, a lot of restoration efforts in Havana, Cuba now. So um, we are beginning to see that this is a crucial part of our history. And I'm so glad, and uh, neon people are the best people. Very quirky, I'm one of them, I'm very quirky, but, um, but really like kind of these undercover mad scientist types. And yeah, yeah, it does, definitely plasma art. And also most neon people, because um, they have to work with clients and work with a lot of people, most of them have the gift of the gab and they tell these tall stories that I'm like, that can't be true. And then I realize, like, oh, there's documentation that that was true. So it's almost like, um, you know, that movie Forrest Gump where it's like one person that just sort of trips through history. Um, you know, neon artists are very smart, so they're in no way kind of like a Forrest Gump character, but in terms of through neon signage that you can chart all these things that have happened to the United States, it's so true and um, it's been so amazing to learn from the artists themselves because they've, you know, they've seen it all. Okay, well, I think we're... Oh, that's a great question. And a pretty thorny one because it really depends on who you ask. Um, there's this guy, George Claude, who claimed he invented neon. He was a showman. He was very successful at what he did and he did make some inventions that helped to propel neon, but he patented the heck out of neon. So he has a very profound influence on the history of neon, but didn't invent it. Then there's this guy, Daniel McFarlane Moore, American. So George Claude was French and a Nazi collaborator. So there's a whole juicy past there. Daniel McFarlane Moore was an American and he was killed by a jealous electrician. So um, that's a whole other thing. There's a whole book about it called Neon A Light History that was written by um, our secretary, Didia Delizer, that I would highly recommend because it's so many juicy tales. Um, also, Nikola Tesla was involved with neon um, and still one of those kind of figures that a lot of neon artists really feel a kinship towards. But I mean, I guess the big answer is it was kind of a collaborative thing across the world that people were playing with this thing. Um, before that even, there was Heinrich Geisler, who is a German guy in the um, 1800s that was doing glass blowing and it, then evacuating the tubes and arcing electricity through. It was kind of like a parlor trick to demonstrate electricity. So a lot of neon artists also take him as kind of a father of the form. But we still use the same tools from the 1920s. So that's, the, that's another beautiful thing. I, I, I'm a teacher first and foremost. That's my life's work. And to be a part of an institution that's actively teaching this craft 
and that we're carrying this craft from the 1920s to present day. There's this clean line that someone who learned from someone who learned from someone who learned. Um, that I think is a really beautiful thing because it is a living art form and it has to be passed down from person to person and has to be carried in your body. It's a very, um, it's like a dance when you see someone working. Well, thank you yeah, so much. my pleasure. Thank you for having me. Just take this out. That was great. I didn't even know I was so interested in this. <laughs> I didn't either when I started. I want to do all these things. <laughs> Our friend David Svensson has been teaching his son, who's maybe, what is he now, 13? Yeah. But since there have been pictures of him since he was eight or so, Right now, the glass, and I, I always think, what a cool dad to go up with all this thing. So, thank you to Corey. And oh, Kevin asked me to mention here we did actually go to the uh, the warehouse some years ago, and we had lovely beer at the Buck Brewery. And, uh, so, I urge anybody to go there when it opens again. It's really interesting and fun. And Kevin asked me to pass this. Um, the Claremont Museum, the Claremont Lewis Museum of Art is looking for two or three part-time museum associates if anyone wants to work at the Claremont Museum um, starting May 10th, or if you know someone who does, see Catherine, she has some uh, flyers. And I think that's all. We go set up the tea up there. You can come have tea. And our next, our next event May. It's sure. Okay. Too close. Um, we're going to go to the solar factory in Pomona, and it will be a dinner. It will be sort of this year's studio visit, for which we provide food and we charge a bit more because the money goes into our endowment funds. And you'll be getting more information about that. And they are making a factory that is a beautiful place to work. Working with different artists and light with light and music and murals. And I think it'll be a very, very interesting trip. So be sure you get our newsletter. And thank you for okaying the new board. And come on out. I'm gonna go get the tea out of the cooler. Also, if anyone wants to see some neon in person, I have this handy salesman suitcase if you wanna <laughs> learn more about it. <laughs>